Hey guys, Mike Urban here, real estate agent in Boston, Massachusetts. And in today's video, I'm going to give you what I consider the most definitive guide for relocating here in Massachusetts. And I'm going to break it apart into five different sections. And then I will iron out different things in those sections. Okay. So the reason this is important, this is what I provide all of my clients, whether we're on a Zoom, a phone call, whatever, and we go over this in detail. I think this is going to be a little bit more helpful for people because they could stop and go at their own pace. And if they want some detailed information on a specific area, they could go back and rewatch that specific area. Um, a lot of people move here and they don't know what to expect. They have an idea of what they want. And to be honest with you, a lot of times people come here and they get, you know, sticker shock. They're not scared of the price, but what they're scared of is what you're getting for the price that you're paying right? I'm not going to break apart prices and stuff like that in this video. You could check out my other videos for that. But what I will do is I'm going to give you the five steps to make the transition easy. Okay, so let's get into the video. First of all, we're going to talk about location and lifestyle. Second, style of home, whether single family, condo, maybe you want a multifamily to rent out one side and live in the other. Transportation, financing, and finally schools. So let's start with location and lifestyle. All right. The first thing that I remind my clients of, right, is, and sometimes the most important because people are moving here for work a lot of times, is your proximity to work, okay? What you can't do is this. Do not go on Apple Maps and try to, you know, check what the mileage is between one town and another or between the city up to a one town or vice versa, right? If you're living outside of the city in a suburb and you're, you're, you're going to drive into the city, don't base it on miles, okay? Four miles at 8 a.m. could be 30 plus minutes or longer. It could be 45 minutes. I've seen an hour plus. It depends on if there's an accident, if there's something going on, if the traffic is just absurdly heavy. Maybe it's a Friday, maybe it's a Monday. You can't base where you're going to live on mileage. You need to do it based on time, okay? And the best app for that is Waze that I find. Because what you could do is you could input the time that you're supposed to be at work or perhaps the time that you want to leave and see how long it's going to take you to get to and from that location. It uses an algorithm in there to figure out how long or how heavy traffic is going to be on a time-by-time -time basis. This is what I recommend to all my clients. Use Waze, figure that out first, all right? And then we're gonna work backwards from there. The next thing is going to be your walkability, right? How close are you to things to do? Things to do. Obviously, if you're in the city, there's gonna be quite a bit of walkability, right? At the cost of your budget, right? Because living in the city can be expensive. Um, but I like to narrow this down into two separate sections, okay? Beside, you know, going to restaurants uh, and going, you know, out at night to a club or whatever, I like to focus on two things because a lot of people don't realize what we have to offer because we do have a major city, okay? But there's other things that you could do outside of the city that are important too. And one thing we have is beaches and we have mountains. If you want the mountains, my suggestion is North Shore or north of the city, okay? Let's say north of the city, north of the city. If you want beaches, south of the city. Now, this does not necessarily mean that you have to live south of the city to go to beaches. That's not true. There is tons and tons of beaches north of the city as well. Uh, there's tons, and that includes New Hampshire, Maine, Plus, you have a lot of mountains in those areas. South of the city, you also have nice beaches. Plus, you have the Cape, Martha's Vineyards, Vineyard, Nantucket. Uh, you have all of that too. But there's definitely less mountains. The only benefit of south of the city is you also have access to Rhode Island, which is a really nice state as well. North of the city, you have New Hampshire, you have Maine, you have Vermont. Uh, there's, in my opinion, more things to do here than there is here. Okay, because you have access to multiple states um, if you live 
north of the city. We live north of the city. We love it. We go to the beaches in Maine. We go to the beaches in New Hampshire a lot, very often. Plus, there's other beaches in Massachusetts that are north of the city as well. You have Gloucester. You have Ipswich. You have... Uh, there's, there's multiple other nooks of, of beaches as well, although not all of them are not huge. Some of them are, okay? Um, so that is my guide to location and lifestyle. Certain areas are going to have think a lot of things to do, and some areas are not if you're looking in a suburb. Some suburbs are like a mini city, right? Like Salem is like a little city. Woburn is almost like a little city. Uh, Med Medford, Somerville, Cambridge, right? These are like little cities, and they're also going to have things to do. The closer you live or the closer you decide to move into the city, the more costly things are, okay? So basically what I mean by that is if you're looking at a suburb that's directly outside of the city, like let's say Cambridge, it's going to be expensive. Your price, price per square foot is high, right? Let's say $750,000 doesn't scare you, but $750,000 might get you a 1,000-square-foot condo. Okay? This is not perfect math. I don't have charts in front of me. I'm just telling you that the closer you are to the city, the more it costly it's going to be. Plus, on top of that, you're going to have less single-family homes. Places are just much more compact and put together, okay? So that's it for location and lifestyle. Style of home. All right. We're going to start getting into the nitty-gritty here. Obviously, we have condos. We have single-family homes, and we have multis. Benefits of the condos are going to be cheaper. Right? Higher walkability. A lot of times they put condos or condo complexes in areas where there is a lot of things to do. And then finally, you're going to have, um, it's going to be an easy transition to sell plus buy, okay? Condos, for the most part, normally sell pretty quickly, um, depending on the location. So, because a lot of times if you're moving here, what I want to uh, stress is if you're moving here and you're not sure where to go, condos are kind of your best bet, right? Because it's something that you could get into cheap and there's going to be more people that could afford a cheaper place uh, than, let's say, a single family home, which in the greater Boston area, probably medium price point, 750 to 760,000. You know, you could get a good, a nice condo for 500 to 600,000, okay? And it'll be more updated as well. That's the other thing, updated. My penmanship is terrible. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Single family home is a good idea because you have plus plus appreciation. Right? Single family homes appreciate at a greater rate than a condo does. Just not double, but it's it's quite substantial. Okay. And they hold their values better, but at the cost of renovations. Right? Getting a, a Renovated single-family home, okay, is kind of hard to come by. And then if you have your cream puff places, which have been like complete renovations, completely gutted, there's competition, lots of competition. Lots of competition for single-family homes, okay? They, they keep on increasing in price. The problem with that is that you end up overpaying. So if you're going to buy something, or you're going to buy, I should say, a single-family home, I would suggest living there for five plus years, okay? Let's say condo, you could, you know, one to two years. And then finally, a multifamily home. Now, this is the option if, by the way, if you're coming from a state where it's very taboo to live in a multifamily home and rent out the other side, that happens often here. And that's really how people build a lot of wealth, okay? Because they end up, not having that large of a mortgage, they're renting out the one side, and then what they do is, or at least what my clients like to do, is rent out their side when they're time to buy, take the equity out of their multifamily, and then purchase a single-family home or purchase something else. So 
The benefits of the multi is lower mortgage. Lower mortgage. Less competition. Right? And ultimately, you're building wealth. Building wealth. Now, on top of that, we could take this a step further, okay? There's going to be multiple types, not that I want to get too focused on this. There's multiple types of condos. There's multiple types of single-family homes, and there's multiple types of multifamilies, right? For condos, you could have a high-rise. You could have a low-rise. For instance, it could be a, in a building with 400 other units, but at the cost of HOA, right? You're going to have to pay an HOA, and that HOA could be $400. It could be $2,500 if it's in the city. And what determines the cost of the HOA is going to be mainly the amenities. So amenities could be stuff like, cool, gym, Ten let's just say tennis courts, just things to do, right? Things to do, social lounges, uh, whatever it may be. The more stuff that's available to do in the condo, parking is another one, right? If it has a parking garage. Uh, the more stuff that's available to do in a condo, the more costly it's going to be on your HOA, okay? Single family homes, you have multiple styles of that as well. We have a lot of really unique looking homes here in Massachusetts. I'm originally from Pennsylvania. I have a real estate team there too. And the homes here are pretty unique. There's a lot of different uh, style homes, a lot of beachy looking homes, and a lot of Victorian looking homes as well. Uh, the, the cool thing is, you have your pick of the litter because you have multiple different styles of homes here. And your choices are sometimes going to be if you want new construction versus resale. Now, we don't have a ton of new construction, but I think that we will have a lot more coming up because of the interest rates going up. Uh, that could be another um, video. But yeah, that's, that's kind of your choices for single family. And then ultimately multifamily, you're going to have, most people are going to be purchasing either a two to a three unit. Perhaps a four, but this is kind of unlikely. Four is unlikely. Only because a lot of times investors are looking for four. You're more than likely not going to get anything more than that because then it turns, your loan type is going to turn into commercial. But that's kind of the way that, I iron out condo single family homes and multifamily homes for somebody. Okay. And the cost of renting here is almost the same as the cost of purchasing, right? Rent keeps on going up. So let's go to the next slide. Types of transportation. Okay. Obviously, your car, bus, train. We have Uber, Lyft, taxi. If you decide to take the T, public trans, like just let's just call this public transportation. You need a pass. I don't know what the cost is for the pass per month, but I think it's three hundred and fifty plus dollars a month. Okay, if you're driving into work, your vehicle. Okay, there's we don't have massive parking lots here in the city, right? You're going to be in a parking garage and it's going to cost you money per month. I would say anywhere from $400 up, right? I've seen parking spaces in the city sell for $300,000 for a parking space, okay? So take that from there. So don't think that you're going to be, you know, you have a car, you're going to drive into work. Figure out where the heck you're going to park. Okay, that, that is honestly one of the most important things. A lot of places don't have parking for you. You need to figure these things out. The other thing is you might be thinking to yourself, well, I have a car. What I'll do is I'll drive to an area with public transportation, park there, and then take public transportation into Boston, which is a good idea too. It's still going to cost you money to get your car from point A to point B, and not only in gas, plus your pass, plus parking. Want to know what the hardest of those three are? The damn parking. Sometimes you go to the lot because you may work at an odd time and the, the lot is full, okay? A lot of these places, the lots will be full. They can't accommodate a million, million, billion cars. So anything that you do in terms of 
moving your vehicle from point A to point B, especially if it's in the city, okay, it's going to cost you money, all right? There's no best option. It really depends on where you are and it, where your work is. That's really, that's really it. So lastly, you might be thinking, well, Mike, you know what? After watching this video, I decided I'm not going to have a car. <laughs> and uh, we're going to sell our car and we're going to, you know, we want to move somewhere close to public transportation. The problem with that, if you want something close to the T, guess what? Costs a lot of money, okay? I've seen places that are $420 a square foot sell for $650 a square foot close to public transportation. The reason is, is because there's access to the T. You don't have to drive. You could get out of your vehicle, not own a car, not pay car insurance. That's actually the other thing. Car insurance here is extremely high. Not that I want to get off topic here. Car insurance is high. The reason is, is because nobody knows how to drive here. Actually, no. Everybody knows how to drive here, but nobody wants to obey the rules of the road and be a respectful driver. I'm sorry to say that if you're watching this video, but it's just the truth. Um, so car insurance is high because there's lots of accidents, okay? So car insurance is super high. And then you also have excise. Oops. If I misspelled anything, I'm sorry, by the way. Excise tax, which is basically your tax to drive your vehicle in a specific town, okay? And it's dependent, it's a percentage of your vehicle's value, all right? So this is something you may not be used to. Um, for instance, I have a 2021 Kia Telluride, okay? It's a three-row Kia, and I think I pay in the vicinity of $600 or $650 per year just to drive my car here, right? It's, it's, it's not cheap. So you have to weigh the options of, hey, hey, is it better that I drive into the city and park my car at a parking garage? I'll have to pay gas. I'll have to pay um, high car insurance, and I'll have to pay the excise tax. You kind of have to weigh those options, okay? Financing. Okay, this is a big one, all right? This is just super big. And the reason it is, at least in the market that we're in in some areas, financing is important because a lot of times, I apologize, a lot of times, we as listing agents are looking for this specifically, local lender. And I have people that call me, uh, sometimes they call me from Google or whatever, they don't know who I am or what I'm for. And when I start talking about using a local lender, I, I feel like they think that I'm, I'm speaking some, uh, some other language because they don't understand why it would take a local lender to get an offer accepted. Local lenders equal accepted offers. Not all the time, right? Accepted offers. One of the main, not that I'm going to go off on a tangent here, but one of the main things that we look for as listing agents, if everything is identical on an offer, it's going to come down who the lender is and who the agent is. But where is the lender working? Okay. Some of the top companies that I recommend are going to be these. This is followed. Okay. Cross country mortgage. The next is going to be guaranteed rate. These are the big ones. Then I really actually like, there's one called Metro Credit Union. You have another good one is, I think it's First Republic. These are all very good local lenders, okay? These are very, very good banks. We're looking for these names, right? At least the top, very much the top two, at least I am, because I know they could get things done. And if you're in a multiple offer situation, guess what's going to happen? It sometimes is going to come down to the lender. If you're watching this video and we're out of COVID or, or whatever, I will tell you that pre-COVID, this was also important because you have these areas of towns or, or, or certain little neighborhoods within a town that you don't have a lot of listings that pop up and you still have 10 to 15 offers, all right? Sometimes you have 40, right? During COVID, we had crazy amounts of offers on our property. So your lender is important, right? And they're going to set up your financing. Most of them will be able to match rates. They'll, they'll give you a good rate. Obviously, talk to your preferred lender from wherever you're coming from. Maybe they can make a recommendation to you. Uh, but I highly recommend using somebody that's local 
do not try to get away with using somebody that is not local, okay? And our rates, all of that, or not our rates, I'm sorry, but our mortgage amounts for jumbo, FHA, VA, uh, USDA, all of that stuff is different here. The amounts change because of the the um, the amount of a purchase price of a single family home, condo, a multifamily. It's just much different here, okay? All right, lastly, schools, okay? I can't talk about this too much, but I have two kids, and it is something that is, you know, somewhat important to us, right? I usually like going to a website. I'm just going to tell you this, niche, or niche, whatever you want to, .com, okay? There's no definitive data. You can't go based on one person's recommendation or not of a school, okay? You can't just say Mike said or this person said or my friend said and their kids did this or this. Like, none of that really matters, right? Even going to this website does not necessarily really matter. You could go as far as looking at test scores and this and where it places. Like, you know, ultimately what really matters is how, like, as a whole, what matters is how well you're teaching your kids at home and how well they're absorbing the information they're being provided at school. If you don't think that they're getting enough, start looking at other schools, okay? But when you are looking for a home, if you want to make it important, start also researching the school districts. I will tell you that coming from another state, the schools here are incredible, okay? The medical here is incredible. Some areas, though, are just beyond incredible, all right? And a lot of people are going to recommend those areas. Don't get pigeonholed into thinking that you have to buy in one of those areas. It's not the case. There is still great schools. So something that you're, you may be considering is price of home versus for a public school versus, let's say, private. Okay? The entry cost of a home in a very highly rated school district is going to be this, very high. And the other thing it's going to be is competitive. Okay? The third thing that's going to be expensive is the taxes. I'm talking 15000 and up, okay? For, I mean, that's just a rough estimate, but... It's going to be expensive if you have any substantial size house. Let's say 1,700 square foot or more, right? 2,000, 2,500 square foot, stuff like that. Weigh the cost of public school versus private or perhaps a charter school and what that's going to cost you. And you end up living in a more walkable area. Okay? Because a lot of times when you're in these areas and the, these, these suburbs and stuff, um, I don't know why I scribbled, but I, I did. When you're in these areas, in the suburbs, like a lot of times you're not going to be close to a lot of things to do. You know, you can't just walk out your house and go to a coffee shop. It's going to be, you know, a couple miles away, stuff like that, right? Private is going to give you some more options when it comes to walkability, things to do. You could live in the city and you could send your kid to a private school. Obviously, it's expensive um, to live in the city as well, but this will open up different types of options, okay? Um, I want to give you a little bit of bonus content, too. I'm going to go back here, and I'm just going to give you an idea of, let me do this. I was going to save this for another video, but I decided not to because I'm already this far in. So what I'm going to talk, this is, we're going to call this bonus, right? Um, the bonus content is going to be condo, single family. The average price of a single-family home in the greater Boston area, you're, you're talking anywhere in the vicinity of $750,000, okay? And that's probably going to be around, let's say, 1,200, maybe to 1,500 square foot, okay? That's a three-bed house, right? Three beds... In a 1,200 square foot house, it's pretty darn small. It's not too bad in a 1,500. You're going to get used to living in smaller areas. We came from a, this is bonus content. If you don't want to watch it, you don't have to. We came from a 4,600 square foot house in Pennsylvania with four bed, four bath on two acres. And now we're in a 1,200 square foot condo. We have two kids, we had two boxers, and we're doing just fine. Um, 
there's going to be that transition where you're trying to get used to living in smaller spaces. If you live here or anywhere around the city, you're going to get used to living in smaller spaces, okay? Condo. I think the median, again, don't take these numbers as definitive. I don't have any charts in front of me, but I know it's around here, okay? Condos are probably in the vicinity of, I would say around 600,000 for a condo. And that is probably for, I think you could probably get a three bed. It might be closer to 650 for a three bed. Three bed condos are quite, not rare, but they, uh, if you're looking in a high rise or something with multiple units, you're not going to see many three bedrooms. A lot of them are going to be studios. They're going to be one bed or they're going to be two bedrooms. So the most typical condo that we see here that are being built is two beds. Oops, two bed. Okay. Three bed. You could find, but a lot of times it's a condo conversion. What that means is it's a multifamily home that was, let's say, a two-unit or a three-unit, and they separated it out into three separate condos, okay? So these are going to be much larger. Let's say 1,300 square foot to 1,700 square foot. Um, condos, in my opinion, are the happy medium for purchasing something here. And the reason that I say that to a lot of my clients is because what happens with a condo is that there's things that you don't have to worry about, right? Like you don't have to worry about your landscaping. You don't have to worry about outside maintenance at all. Right? Inside maintenance is up to you, right? That's going to be up to you if you own. Um, but from the walls in, that's all you're taking care of, okay? You don't have to worry about snow removal. You won't have to worry about cutting the lawn. A lot of times when people come here for work and they're trying to figure things out, right? Sometimes they just want to get to their job. They don't want to have to worry about those things. And the cost of labor and the cost of just doing things here or having things done for you is going to be this. It's, it's much more expensive in this area than it is in a lot of parts of the country. Um, it's just the way that it is here. It's, it's just more expensive. Um, so my suggestion, if you're just moving here, you're trying to figure things out and, and you don't want to pay the cost of rent is to buy a condo. Okay. Now, if you have some money and you want to build equity and you're eventually perhaps going to rent this out or, uh, you know, you want to have something here for the future, I would say definitely buy a single family home if your budget allows it, because your single family homes are going to appreciate, like I said, in the previous slides, they're going to appreciate at a much greater rate. Um, in five years, you're going to have, let's say, hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity versus maybe $50,000 in equity in a condo, okay? Um, that's really what I wanted to go over. The other benefit of a condo is that since the cost is lower, it gets you closer into the city. Single family homes, you're going to be quite a ways far out of the city. So if you know, it's you and, you know, your partner or whatever, and you don't have any children yet, stuff like that, you know, it might be in your best interest to buy a condo that's closer to the city. That way you could drive into the city or you could take the T into the city and, you know, you could do everything that the city has to offer, right? Um, obviously, single family homes are definitely more geared towards a family with a backyard, et cetera, et cetera. However, you could get a condo with the backyard as well, especially if it's a condo conversion, all right? Now let's talk about one last thing, which is going to be multifamilies, right? The reason I like multis, right? You get the benefits of living in one side and then renting the other, right? If you're get, collecting $2,500 in rent for the other side and your mortgage is 5000 right? You're only paying $2,500 for a mortgage for a $5,000 or in total for a $5,000 mortgage, right? You're building equity, right? Let's say you had a three unit, cut this down to maybe 2,000 plus another two. Now that number turns into 4,000. Of course, this initial number is going to go up, but let's just say it goes up to 6,000, right? Now you're only paying $2,000 to live in a multifamily. And the multifamilies here, I can't stress this enough, the multifamilies here can be very, very nice. And a lot of them are almost like condo conversions, right? Like think of it as a condo conversion. 
Yes, you might have somebody below you, above you, whatever, but you are building equity. And then finally, guess what happens when, you're, when it's time for you to move on and either uh, sell the place or rent or whatever? Let's eliminate your living here, right? And now you have three units you could collect rent on, right? So now you're getting anywhere from $6,000 plus per month for your investment. And you have the benefit of the appreciation plus the money you saved on your mortgage, okay? The other added benefit of the multi is that there's less competition for a multifamily home. There's less people that were originally looking for a condo or a single family home that are also looking at multis. Who you do introduce into the mix is investors. But a lot of times investors are not looking for a two unit. They're looking for three to four units. Most of the time it's a four unit because on a per unit basis, you're actually spending less money per unit for a four unit than you are for a two unit. Okay. I hope that makes sense. So in total, what we went over today, relocating to Boston and the five steps plus the bonus that I gave you in order to move here. There is a lot of other information I could go over. It could be beaches. It could be things to do with the family, stuff like that. I'm going to save that for a future video, but I hope this made sense to you guys. And if you have any questions at all, always feel free to reach out to me. And uh, if there's anything I missed or you want me to provide you with anything else, leave it in the comments below. Always please subscribe, like the channel. Uh, it, it really keeps me motivated to make these videos, especially this long one. This has been like 30 minutes of my time here. Um, so yeah, I'm signing off. Have a good day.